What's happening everybody? Jack Jones here. I have something a little different for you today. This is a podcast with my friend Connor Hall and Connor is the owner of Team Allegiance which is a esports team, a professional esports team, and he started this just uh, under two years ago, and already they've gone on to have really great success. So his team took second place in the Halo World Championships, so they took half a million dollars in prize money for that. He has teams that compete professionally within Gears of War, within Call of Duty, in Smite and he is doing really great things within esports his teams are all they are all competing they're all winning at the professional level so they are at the highest level of esports and he gets to go to these massive big tournaments right like the Halo tournament was out in Colorado so they got to go out to Colorado it was part of the X Games and they got to be part of all of that so um, I think that was really cool and so Connor is 23 years old he just graduated from college not even two years ago and this is his full-time job he owns a professional esports team and he was able to uh, build the business plan, pitch the idea to investors, get investment money from investors to go, then go out and start uh, recruiting players, hiring players, and to build out his team. So I think it's really cool what he's been able to do. And he's basically created this job for himself where he gets to travel around to these different tournaments, um, just hang out at tournaments, manage his players, have the excitement of seeing his own team compete and win at these tournaments. Um, and so both Connor and I think that there is a massive, massive opportunity within esports. We believe that esports will be bigger than traditional sports in another decade or two. So bigger than the NFL, bigger than Major League Baseball, bigger than the NBA. And all of these jobs that you see now within these traditional sports, like jobs of like broadcasting and there's cameramen and there's agents and there's managers and there's trainers. Um, there's this whole, you know, multi, multi-billion dollar industry that surrounds professional sports this is going to spring up around esports is already starting to spring up but it's going to grow exponentially within the next you know 10 20 years so if you want to have a job where your job is to help produce video game content help um be involved in esports and just be around the culture and the atmosphere of video games all day, every day, that's possible, right? So that is possible now. So I just want to get you thinking about that, that you don't have to get you know a regular job anymore. You really could make a full-time living working within esports and that those opportunities are only going to grow. So before we start the podcast, I want to let you know that I've created a free 30-day guide. It's an ebook on how to gain the most strength and the most muscle that you can at home using just a couple of pieces of equipment. So that guide is down below in the equipment. All you got to do is click the link, put in your email, and the ebook will go to your inbox immediately. So definitely check out that because that answers a lot of these same questions that I get over and over again about how frequently should I work out, um, et cetera. It has a 30-day complete workout plan. It has a 30-day complete nutrition plan. And it has uh, just kind of a lot of other information that's really good for you. Everything you need to have success in a nice, easy, simple 30-day plan format for you. So go check that out, and now we'll just jump into the podcast. So I was able to catch up with Connor this weekend over the Midwest Campus Clash, which was a $25,000 League of Legends tournament that Columbia College hosted for other college teams. So, so here's another opportunity for you guys out there. Colleges all across the U.S. are starting to see the value of esports. So I think there's about a dozen colleges right now that give athletic scholarships for League of Legends players. So yeah. That's right, you heard that right. They give college scholarships for people to go to their school, attend their school for free, and then play League of Legends. And then they take these teams just like other sports teams do. They'll travel around the country, they'll go to other colleges, they will compete um, against these other colleges, and also they'll do tournaments like this. So this was a $25,000 League of Legends tournament, and it was eight teams from eight different colleges and universities. So um, that was really cool. That was a lot of fun. So without further ado, I'll just jump into the podcast. Um, I'll cut to some scenes of the Midwest Campus Clash so you can see what that was like. And then you'll just hear from me and Connor. On to the back line, but how long can you stay there? Borneo's going to find his ass. He's going to go down cat this is the Midwest Clash Tournament, or Midwest Campus Clash, and it is a League of Legends and Madden tournament. And so it consists of collegiate teams, I don't know all the teams, but it is roughly about 20 teams that were here this weekend, and they were playing for one of the largest prize pools in the Midwest. So this was a great turnout, I mean the whole entire venue was packed, 
um, and we're about to go watch the finals. We're at the Allegiance booth. We were here all day at the Midwest Clash. And so we had our booth here. We had two different setups. Uh, myself and our players were playing here today and we would be challenged against two other players that were just spectators at the event. So we got to do that for about eight hours today. It was a long day. We played Halo and Call of Duty and then it was all broadcasted on this middle screen and then we had a, just a nice booth with our apparel and other things about Allegiant. All of our apparel was on this booth. A lot of people came up and purchased it and we were able to you know, see some of the people walking around that were spectators wearing our stuff. So it was cool to be here because only, we only go to events to compete and this was our first time that we had a booth to just kind of like share our, mes our message and our mission with everyone. When I was growing up and I was in elementary school, early elementary school, I was pretty interested in sport video games. So games like Madden, um, NBA 2K, any of those sort of games. I would play that on the PlayStation 2 and I would play it all the time. Um, that wasn't really the start of it for me, but I, that's like where I was introduced to the PlayStation and fall in love with video games. The The true start of it, though, that I would consider is when I got my Xbox, and for my birthday, I received Halo 2. And that's when I really started my competitive esports career. And I got that when I was in fifth grade, so I guess I wasn't supposed to have Halo at that time, because um, it was rated, you know, like T for Teen. But I got that game, and I instantly fell in love with the first-person shooter style of gameplay and would play consistently and I would land with my friends and when I grew up and started going to middle school and more and more people were playing the game that went to school with me then you know I would land with them and realize pretty quickly that I had kind of a, an advantage over my friends and was just had that natural talent for first person shooters and then once I realized that I started competing and traveling to events Talk about like your first event. Where did you go? I went to Nashville, Tennessee for an MLG combine, which means that it was for the amateur players. None of the professionals were able to compete. They would go and attend and do some content pieces for the tournament organizers. But I went there when I was, I think I was 15 or 16, um, and I had to be accompanied by my dad just because he didn't trust me to go on my own. But I went there and... That was my first event that really stood out to me. Um, I went to a couple like local events that were nearby, but the first big event, which I would consider as MLG, Major League Gaming, was in Nashville. And once I went there, I realized that this was for me and that I wanted to compete more and travel to as many events as I could. So how did you how do you get into professional gaming? Because that's probably a lot of um, a lot of people want to know that. So back then it was very there was a very like easy route that you could take to where you could go to these amateur events or that's why the combine was created was for these amateur players or upcoming aspiring professionals could show off their talents to all these other professional players and hopefully get picked up by one of the professional teams nowadays it's a little different um most of the stuff that you do is competing online and you really want to match up against these professionals climb these online ladders and every game is very different. I am League of Legends, for example, that's not a game that I competed in because, like I said, I'm a first-person shooter type of player. But those games, you have these online leaderboards or these solo queue ladders that you can go in by yourself, climb it on your own, improve your own individual gameplay, and trying to get noticed that way. Um, but for Halo, what I would do is there were things like game battles that I would compete in online, and if you are lucky enough to match a professional, that's when you really wanted to showcase how good you were. And so there's not like a clear cut way in order to become a professional. And that's what I'm hoping comes from, you know, the collegiate esports scene that's growing today. But yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing that is like that stands out to saying, OK, this is what you need to do. And it's just a matter of going to these open events that allow amateur players to attend um, and also just practicing as much as you can online and trying to get into some of these professional player lobbies and matches. Nowadays, there's a lot of money in video games. I mean, Halo this year is going to be competing for a million dollars this month. Um, back when I was competing, I was competing for $10,000 in the total prize pool. I mean, when I was competing at a top level, though, um, and I was at my best, I was about 17 or 18. So at that time, 17 or 18, did you feel like gaming was interfering with your life at all? Yes. Um, in fact, the reason I, the reason why I stopped competing um, at the age of 18 
um, was because I was going to college and I had to decide between competing or focusing on my academics. So I decided to focus on academics because college at the time for me was more like the most important thing in my life. It was very expensive to go to college and I wanted to be sure I performed my best. Um, you know, and at the time there wasn't much money in video games, so it just didn't make sense for me to put all my effort into it. Do you think your decision would be different if you were at that same spot today with as big as the esports scene is? Yeah, I think it would have. I think I would have given it maybe like had a leap year um, and really tried my best to make myself a professional and make video games as a competitive player a career for myself. Um, but yeah, I, the money just wasn't there. The 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 media, the the tournament organizers, they just weren't there at the time. So let's fast forward like through college now and. Um, well, let's talk about college. Did you play much video games in college, or did you just focus on kind of getting through school? Yeah, I, I love video games. I, mean, I I've been passionate about video games since I started um, when Halo Two was in my hands in fifth grade, and so I would always play it casually. There was nothing that I I, I always would play it in the dorms, um, in my apartment, whenever I had some free time. It was a great way for me to escape and just to relax when I was. You know, I wanted to take a break from studying or taking exams or anything like that. So I would play it um, quite often, but it just wasn't to the extent of when I was trying to be a competitor. How did you transition from school to now working full time within uh, running a you know team allegiance, running a esports team? How does that happen? So when I was in school, I started it my senior year of college and. It was really hard to balance my schoolwork and then managing a professional team. At the time, I only had one or two professional teams under the Allegiance brand. I guess let's let's rewind real quick. How did that? Um, how did you see that as an opportunity? What what made you think like, hey, I should start an esports team? It kind of came out of nowhere. Um, that was always a dream of mine to start a professional organization. I always had in the back of my mind that I think I could manage a team. And I had the skill set in order to properly manage one. And so when I had the opportunity and I met an investor who was also interested in this idea and was willing to help me create this dream of mine, it was a no-brainer for me to start it. Um, I'm being a competitor myself and knowing what it takes to be a top player, even though I necessarily wasn't in it in being a professional um, for Halo. I Because when I was doing it, like I said, it was kind of like the dark ages for the game and it just wasn't super successful, I still knew what it took. And so whenever I had the opportunity to sign my first team and to start the brand called Allegiance, it was a no-brainer. I wanted to start it right away, and having the support that I needed to do it just really assured myself that I was able to make this dream happen and to create a successful brand. So let me cut in. What? How do you convince an investor, hey, let's put um, good money into a video game team? Because that seems like, for a lot of people, that seems like it would be kind of a crazy investment, right? How do you convince them to do, put money in? It is a crazy investment. Um, I'm actually really surprised that I was able to make it happen because I didn't have a business plan in place at the time. I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. Like I said, it was a dream for me. I mean, it was a fantasy of mine that I wanted to create this brand, wanted to manage not just one professional team, but multiple ones. And so when I had an investor approach me and saying, what do you want to do in esports? Like, what would be your dream job? Immediately, I mentioned this idea of starting a professional organization and how I would run it. And I think it was my vision that sold the investor on the idea and why I thought I could do it the right way and make it successful. And the reason or the way I proposed this was that I was a competitor at the time. I knew where the scene was and what needed to happen in order to change the scene, and I was able to execute on it and to make this organization different than anyone else. So, and so presenting that in a way that was very professional and that I was educated enough on the idea and the scene itself, I think was the reason why he invested in it. Yeah, so I mean, I have a little bit of background on, because um, we've known each other for uh, two, I guess going on two years now, and you know, um, just from hearing other people talk about you, like uh, our mutual friend Bill, um, he thinks Connor 
he will pretty much put money in whatever Connor is doing because he believes in Connor that much. So I think probably it'd be good to give a little bit of background about um, what you what you did before you landed this investment. Like, what were you working on? What projects were you working on? What were you doing um, within school and out of school? And um, because you, you know, it, it wasn't just because uh, you had a great idea and you used to be a professional gamer. I think a lot of the reason you got that investment is um, he really you know, believes in you as a person and as an entrepreneur. He, he just believed because based on your previous track record um, that you would make something successful. So maybe talk a little bit about kind of what you did um, during your college years to get you to that point where someone would have enough faith in you to, hey, I'm going to put money in a video game team. Yeah, so when I stopped competing in Halo, I... I still wanted to do something in my life that was competitive. And it might not necessarily have been sports because in college, you know, there's just not those kind of opportunities anymore. And so I found my new passion, which was in entrepreneurship. And so I found that pretty early. And I actually found that within like the first couple of weeks of college. And I joined an entrepreneur club. And pretty soon after I joined the entrepreneur club, I became the president of it. And so when I started this entrepreneur club and I really started growing it for, I did it for about three years in school. While I was doing that, I was helping others build their business. I was also trying to start my own. And whenever I combined both of my passions in video games and entrepreneurship, that's when I really saw my future um, career for myself. And it actually started with you and doing Epic Ed. And so Epic Ed was a business to where we were trying to work with the youth in Columbia, Missouri and hosting gaming camps to help teach these young kids the important aspects of life that you would also learn through traditional sports. And so I did that for a couple of years, um, did it for I did two different summer camps and they were both really successful. And so when I did that, I showed that I really knew the gaming industry. I was a professional uh, not a gaming professional, but just a business professional. And I presented myself really well in front of these kids and teaching them how to gain the most out of gaming and to really give them a head start in life that you might not necessarily learn through anything else that you do in school. And so when I did that and I worked with Bill on this and shared my vision with him, it really displayed, I guess, my vision for what I wanted to accomplish in esports. And that's when everything just started to move forward on not just Epic Ed, but other businesses. Mm -hmm. The way I met my investor for Allegiance was through a company called Esports Booth. And the idea there was that we wanted to create apparel for professional esport organizations and building jerseys, shirts, any, any items that you would see for like the MLB or the NFL. Um, for those professional teams and when I presented this at a competition and that was a big thing like I said I'm a competitor and I would go to these entrepreneurship competitions and wanted to showcase like what I could do in my work ethic in hopes that I could find something like allegiance and this is where this all transpired so I did the esports booth idea at a, an event called startup weekend and we were able to accomplish a lot within the 54 hour weekend that we were given. And so I presented this idea, worked on it for 54 hours, and then we, I presented it again in front of a panel of judges. And one of the judges on the panel was actually our current investor in Allegiance. And he really liked my presentation, what I was able to um, present across to not just the judges, but to the entire audience. And that's just where everything started. And I was able to get him on a lunch date and explain what I wanted to accomplish with allegiance. And then that's where it all started. So I think it's really my professionalism as a business person and my work ethic. And then also what I want to accomplish in esports is what has gotten me a lot of support from not just bill, but from a bunch of other people. I think a lot of gamers probably have different ideas for, um, you know, they think there's, there's different needs that aren't being met and there's different opportunities. But I think a lot of, uh, you know, me, especially when I was younger, um, I would get stopped by fear by these thoughts of, well, what if I fail? What if it doesn't succeed? What if this or that uh, bad thing happens? And kind of the idea of getting up in front of a pitch competition and pitching would have been just totally out of the question. So how do you think you got to the point where, um, you know, as a senior in college, you're able to uh, take your ideas and execute on them and to kind of face these fears? 
I think it all started with me joining that entrepreneurship club my freshman year of college. Um, I know a lot of gamers that are very secluded. They stay at home and they just play video games all day long and they don't socialize. And that is what really helped me grow. I, and I had to get out of my comfort zone and move on from myself as a competitor and get involved with something. And working in the entrepreneurship club, attending meetings every week, also leading the group um, made me feel really comfortable with starting these competitions and presenting myself as the leader of the groups that I was involved with. So I think it was just a matter of me finding my my comfort areas, getting involved with things that I was very passionate about. And I know a lot of these gamers that are saying to themselves right now, like, I'm very passionate about video games. But it's it's a lot more than that. I mean, that makes the presentation just a lot easier for me because I feel like when I go in front of these crowds that I know everything that I'm presenting better than anyone else in the audience. And I'm just extremely confident in whatever I'm presenting in that I'm educating these people on what I've learned through my past and my history in the industry. And so that makes the presentations just that much easier. But and at the same time, you do need to learn how to present yourself professionally, get involved, and learn those personable skills that you're not just going to learn behind a screen playing video games. And so I think there are necessary steps in order to get to that point. And that was something that I had learned over a three-year period when I was going to these meetings, going to these clubs. I, it wasn't like my first competition I went to was a success. I mean, it definitely was you know, multiple, I definitely a large handful of events that I had to go to first. So the message really is to, we, we need to start putting ourselves out there. Uh, we can't just expect success to materialize. We need to start getting out of our comfort zone. And you're not going to go out and pitch a successful pitch on your first pitch and, you know, get investment to build an esports team. But it was all the work that Connor did leading up to that through his years in his club and just constantly getting out of his comfort zone until he got to the point where he becomes confident enough to get out in front of um, this panel of judges and then lands an investor for kind of his dream business. So let's go into uh, Team Allegiance now. And I mean, so I'll let you tell the story, but um, it uh, I remember when Team Allegiance was in the Halo World Championships, right? And as that was the moment I was like, whoa, Connor really has something here. So can you talk about kind of how, um, how you got to that point in Team Legion? Because that was pretty on, early on in your, uh, your team's history, right? Oh, yeah. That was um, the first team we ever signed. And I mean, the Legion started because it's a synonym and de is derived from the term loyalty. And at the time, a lot of these organizations... They were taking advantage of their players. They weren't necessarily paying their players salaries on time. They would make promises and not follow through on them. And I wanted to be someone different. And so that's why I started the Allegiance brand. And it all started with the Halo team. And we started in Halo because that's where I came from as a competitor and where I started falling in love with esports. And so quickly after we signed our first team in Halo, we became the number one team in the world within like two months time. And so that was obviously very eye opening to me and showed that I, I could definitely do this and that I could create an esport organization that revolves around talent and that we could build successful teams in any game we get involved in. So after we did, um, or we started off in first place during the regular season, it was time to get into the playoffs. And so we were in the playoffs, I'm being the number one team in the world, it made it very easy for us to qualify for the Halo World Championship. Um, but as like the season went on and the playoffs continued, there were other teams that kind of came out of the woods and were performing really well and actually ended up starting to get really close to our skill level and trading games back and forth in the series. Um, and so when we came to the World Championship, it was the biggest event for Allegiance, um, it was the most important event for us, and we really wanted to do well here so that we could, you know, have this organization on the map in comparison to these other esport teams. And so when we went to the um, World Championship, we were competing for a total of um, 2.5 million, I believe. And it ended up being a, an event that I'll never forget. And we ended up placing second. And we were we were able to walk away with $500,000 and really allowed us to expand into more games that we're involved with today. 
And that's like where it all started. And this was all within five to six months time. So for, I guess for my own curiosity and a lot of people out there who uh, don't know professional sports as well, uh, what, what can a, a player on a team expect to make if they're doing, if you go out and you win, uh, you don't have to give like specific numbers, but like, uh, what what is I guess you know when you were playing professionally there wasn't really money there so what are the players now what do their days look like and how are they able to um, are they able to make a living off of just playing like say Halo? Yeah, I, they they are able to make a lot of a comfortable income actually. I when I played I made zero dollars annually. Um, <laughs> I was definitely down um, in money because I had to pay for travel expenses. But nowadays, these players are not only able to get reimbursed for all their travel from an organization like Allegiance, but they also make a monthly salary. Every game is different um, depending on the like the fan base and the viewership. The salary, you know, it it, it varies. I mean, in the games that we're involved with. Um, salary can range from a thousand dollars a month to like three thousand dollars a month per player, but then they also make money through their Twitch streams, um, YouTube content, tournament winnings. I mean, so the event that we went to, I like our Halo players last year, all made well over six figures because of our success um, at the World Championship and previous events. And some of our players, I mean, I know a couple of the players that I've worked with, they've made over $30,000 a month from just content alone. So, I mean, they can make a very comfortable living. Um, and it's crazy to believe how much things have changed just within the five-year time or five year period from when I competed or when I stopped competing to now where I'm owning a professional organization. So someone that's listening, if they're passionate about video games, um, what can they do to start start making video games like what are, what are the paths that you see that someone who's passionate about video games can take to to just be working within video games to make a living from video games so now there's there's opportunities where you don't just have to be a competitor but where you can actually work in the industry as someone like myself to where you don't have to necessarily create your own brand and run an organization, but you could work for an organization like mine. You could work for a tournament organizer and hosting events. You could be a referee. You could do video. Um, you could create videos. You can do graphic design. And there's so many different things. But if you want to be a player, you don't even necessarily need to be a professional. You could be a personality. And so there's so many different things that you can do from your home to where you can be a streamer and make a lot of money through there. In fact, some of my players make the most of their money, not through my salary and through tournament winnings, but just being a personality and streaming um, from their own monitor at home and through their desktop or console. So, I mean, the best way to do it, in my opinion, is not to necessarily try to be a professional right away, but playing video games is like you can play casually, you can play competitively, but you can start streaming on Twitch today by just making an account, buying a webcam, um, and just building an account today and just starting your stream at any moment in time and those are things that you can start pretty immediately and you don't have to be necessarily a top level player and it's just being personable like engaging with your fans or community that are watching you so your viewers um and you can do that pretty quickly and easily let's let's talk about where allegiance is today like what um what games are you involved in and uh, what are you excited about? So right now we are involved with Halo, Call of Duty, Smite, Years of War, and Super Smash Brothers, and we also have one speedrunner. So as of now, like I'm pretty comfortable in the games that we're in, um, and also the teams that we have under the brand. But I'm very excited to expand outside of just the professional field and to bring in those personalities and influencers like I've been mentioning. I think that's a whole new aspect of the industry and seeing how much Twitch has grown um, since I've started this business has really opened my eyes to the possibilities out there to build out the brand. And so right now I, I really like the teams that we have under Allegiance and where that's headed. But to expand outside from that and to work with influencers that can, and I'm not necessarily the brains behind the branding of all of this. I, and I started doing that when I started Allegiance. Um, that's not really been my forte, but 
working with these influencers to help me learn how to build a personality, how to build a brand, and to grow it from that stance rather than just bringing on talent that is very good for professional gameplay. That's what I'm most excited about. Awesome. So I guess, um, so you've had some challenges as far as uh, just like being purely competitive esports. It's a really unpredictable, that's the word I'm looking for. It's kind of an unpredictable environment because like you can go and you can take in half a million dollars from the Halo World Championships, but then if one of your players has a bad day, maybe you bring in zero dollars and that's, you know, that's a kind of a massive fluctuation. So um, just I know from talking to you in other conversations, that's been a challenge. So kind of uh, talk me through how you've, you're problem solving that problem and what your thought process is like to like trying to figure out how do you make um, the team more of a sustainable um, long term success. Yeah, so last year um, we got second place at the Halo World Championship, and now this past weekend we didn't even qualify for the Halo World Championship, so we won't be attending. And this is something that is very difficult to swallow because, you know, you see that immediate success and you think, okay, we're going to be, you know, just like being one of the best organizations. We have great recruiting, great management, and we're going to succeed forever. But that's not the case at all. Um, You know, there's things that you have to kind of expect and it's hard to do that because this is very variable i mean i'm not a player i just manage the players and so you really hope that you'll see them succeed and they'll help you qualify and they'll place really well but you can't depend on that and so that's why i really want to work with influencers and building out personalities so that you can have that following and it's a little bit more consistent and so, you know, a lot of these teams, they also are struggling from the same thing. I mean, right now we're all competing against each other. There's a lot of money in esports. We're all trying to buy out certain players and trying to build the best teams as possible. But at the end of the day, not everyone's going to have the best team. And unfortunately, this year we were kind of in that boat. But, you know, that's why it's kind of like investing um, in the stock market. You want to be diversified. You want to have your hands in quite a few different avenues. Um, and for us, we're trying to not just invest in professional teams. We want to invest in influencers. We want to maybe invest in other services and products that we can provide to esport fans and players out there in the community. Um, one of the things that we have created and built a partnership around is with a company called Vital Fuse, who has a product called Fuse Focus. And that is something that we're trying to bring to gamers. And so, really trying to diversify the business and to multiple different things is really what I'm focusing on because I don't want to be dependent on us placing well at every single event. That's just not how it works. Um, And you definitely see this in traditional sports. You don't see the same team winning the Super Bowl every year or even making the playoffs for that matter. So really just trying to spread ourselves out through a a bunch of different things um, is what we're trying to do to prevent us, you know, or trying to help provide and support the organization aside just from tournament winnings. Yeah, so it kind of seems like from our conversation um, with you working so intimately in the esports field, you see that kind of the stable long-term opportunity is more in building um, building a brand around more just kind of content and personality rather than trying to be the absolute best uh, player because that seem it's much harder, I guess, to be the best player than it is to build a consistent. Uh, content and brand would you say that's pretty accurate yeah i i would say that's pretty spot on yeah so i guess how that would apply to the listening audience is that um it should give you some good hope in that you don't have to be the best player in the world to make a successful living within video games Um, i think more if you can just harness your passion and start producing content and start um, diving in and building kind of a brand around just kind of like you know what i've been doing with healthy gamer i'm not at all a good or i I probably don't even rank as a mediocre video game player but because i can create um, content around that it doesn't matter how good i am it's more of uh, you know delivering value and being able to uh, put out useful content for people and then so i'm able to make a living uh, through video games, I guess I haven't had a real job for four years now. I just realized, and so that's been kind of neat. Even though you know I'm not making a ton of money yet, I've been able to have my time um, to be able to go and play video games when I want, and to go you know take six months off to hike the Appalachian Trail because I've kind of pursued, uh, like Connor has, this um, this passion 
uh, video gaming and like how do I turn this into a living? Two organizations that have really stood out to me and what has influenced me to kind of not just focus on building successful teams are Optic Gaming and FaZe Clan. They're both console orgs um, who have both now just recently expanded into the PC world, um, but both of them have not just focused on placing well at tournaments, they've focused on building high-quality content, like you mentioned. And so what Optic Gaming has really done a good job with is bringing on gamers. Some of them are professionals, but they have really focused on building personalities and building great content on YouTube to help promote their brand and to build an organization that just has a massive fan base, not because they're professionals, but because they love the people that are behind the organization. And so that has really influenced me to bring on influencers and personalities and just great people in the industry to build content that would promote allegiance and to give a bigger meaning to the organization. FaZe Clan, on the other hand, they have done a phenomenal job in connecting not just esports and the players together, but connecting esports and healthy living together. And so they have a few people, actually a lot more than a few, but a good amount of people that are under the organization that promote a healthy living, but also manage their time um, not just playing video games, but like just having a good lifestyle. And so they promote that a lot through YouTube, Twitter, Snapchat, and through a bunch of social media channels. And so with their success there and connecting a completely different thing that was irrelevant to video games. I mean, physical health usually doesn't have much, um, you know, it doesn't really have much of an impact on your gaming life, but they made it something that does have a large impact. They have shown that if you are living a healthy lifestyle, that you you have more endurance, that you can game longer. You'll perform better in gaming. And so they've really connected two different passions of their gamers um, or through their organization members to promote that out to a following that is very unique and have built their own fan base. And so that is something that I'm trying to figure out now with Allegiance and how we can connect the influencers that we bring on that are gamers now, but also connect it with something different. And so those two organizations have done a really good job in show- showcasing personalities and building a brand that's not just professional gaming. Maybe you could talk about kind of the future that you see um, for gamers to get uh, to play for college teams, and where do you think that's going? I think the collegiate scene is going to be one of the high, or probably the fastest growing scene for esports. Not the professional. The professional level has already been growing really fast, um, and the growth is insane. But the college scene is what I think is going to be the next big thing, and will be broadcasted all the time. I mean, right now there's not a ton of colleges that are offering scholarships. But I think within the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of the bigger D1 schools that are in the NCAA will also start their programs and offer scholarships to high-level players. And so I think a lot of the gamers, I mean, if they're aspiring to be a professional, this would be a great stepping stone for them. I, I can see right now there's about 50 schools that are offering scholarships, and I think it will be you know close to 500 in the next couple of years. I think most of the schools, um, colleges, and universities will be offering this in the near future. Are there any resources, good resources right now for, say, someone is in high school and they're really good at League of Legends for finding these schools um, that offer scholarships? That's a really good question. I don't think there's a good resource now um, that will direct you to a college that is offering this, although there is a new league that is forming called the NACE. Um, which stands for the National Association of Collegiate Esports. I believe the link or the URL is nacesports.org, and it shows a list of the colleges that are joining the league for 2017. So if you are interested um, and there's a school near you, then I would you know, definitely reach out. I think they all have applications to um, apply to be a part of their esports team. But other than that, there's no um, clear way to get in contact with these colleges. But I know in the near future that there's going to be um, a new resource that's provided by that league so that it, there is an easier way to connect. So you're 23 and you own one of the top 50 professional esports teams in the country. So, I mean, that's that's really 
good success for anybody, but especially for someone that's 23. So what do you think are the key, like your key character traits or your um, habits or that have led you to be able to be where you're at now? I think the biggest one is resiliency. Um, for the reason that we talked about earlier, I, you, you aren't going to win every tournament. Um, what I just experienced today or earlier this week was that we didn't qualify for the Halo World Championship, and you can't let that failure prevent you from continuing moving forward and trying to find that success. And so with how many teams we have and how many tournaments we compete in, it, it you have to be... You have to be looking forward and not just, you know, dreading the past of, okay, we just lost this tournament, it's all over. And so having that character trait that you always are looking forward and trying to move past the failure that you just happened um, is really important. Another thing, too, is having that leadership quality that I, I gained from being in that entrepreneurship club. That was really big for me. And so I think the combination of resiliency and leadership has brought me to where I am today. How do you think you develop resilience yourself? I think it comes with just having failure. I mean, it's really it's really a hard trait to to learn. Um, but when you have that failure and you just have to think like, okay, it's not over. I what's the worst thing that can happen from this failure? And thinking, okay, what are the next steps moving forward? I I, I just try to think positively and be optimistic with everything that happens in my life. So. I mean, just having that positive thinking um, will really go a long way. Do you think your earlier life experiences playing tournaments helped you become more resilient? Yes, because I lost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have such a passion for it to where there was nothing else I wanted more than to be the best player in the game. And that's also transferred <laughs> over to this professional organization um, because I want to always have the best team in every game I'm involved with. And if we lose and we aren't, I mean, we haven't won a tournament yet, actually. Um, we haven't. I haven't been able to raise a trophy over my head with my teammates, and so that wanting that more than anything in my life has made me want to continue working on this every day, and I want to do everything in my power to get to that point. So, do you have days? Because you seem to me, you seem like you're pretty energized and motivated most days. Do you have days where you just don't want to do anything? Because you have a lot of stuff going on all the time. Yeah. Um, in fact, most of the times when we have a poor performance in a tournament, it usually kills my vibe. And I just, you know, some you're not going to have every day where you're very energetic and wanting to work. I, I believe I have a good work ethic, but at the same time, there are days where everyone is just not going to be on on point. And so I definitely have those days. Um, you know, I probably have a couple of those a month, but the days that I am in a positive mood... I try to make the most of it and try to get as much done as I can on those days that I'm feeling great and try to accomplish as much as I can. Awesome. I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Do you have any kind of last words, uh, last words of wisdom for gamers who I think for a lot of people, this is going to be eye opening for them to think that it's it's not only possible, but there's going to be a lot of opportunities to make a living in the video game industry so that they don't ever have to get a quote unquote real job. So, um, yeah, just from where you're at, you're probably, um, one of the people best placed to see where the industry is going. Um, just what would you tell people who are really passionate about video games and who have listened to this whole podcast and think like, Hey, this is something that I might want to do. I think the most important thing is that resiliency thing that I mentioned. I think if, you know, you're not going to see success overnight and you should just continue to put as much effort in, even if you aren't seeing the results that you want to see. Um, and it definitely takes time. And like you said, this is something that you, the healthy gamer, you've been working on for quite some time now. And it's not like you built a following immediately after one video. You have to be persistent with the work that you do and being sure that you are trying to output the best things you possibly can to you know, your fan base, your viewership, or even other professionals out there. And if you want to be noticed, you have to be giving it your all at all times and trying to make something of yourself that's unique and differentiate yourselves from everyone else in the industry. But I mean, it's definitely possible for anyone out there that wants to make this a career for themselves to do it. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that I have worked with that didn't think that they would be where they are today, but they just never gave up. And over time, they found the success that they were wanting. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Connor. Um, one last thing, if people want to get a hold of you, like where can they find Team Allegiance um, and where can they find you on social media? We're pretty much on every social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram. You can find us on there. Uh, most of the handles, if you just search Team Allegiance, will pop up. If you want to find me, my name is Connor Hall, um, but I go by instinct in the gamer world. So if you want to search me on there, I'm sure I'll pop up. So yeah, I can connect with me on any social media, and I usually respond. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Connor. Yep. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it.